Hi everyone, I'm Pastor Garrett. I'd like to welcome you to this online resource from Christ Lutheran Church. Uh, if you're new to Christ Lutheran Church, just encourage you to learn more about us by going to our website, which is clcscv.org. Or maybe the better way to get to know us a little bit more personally uh, would be to come to worship on a Sunday morning. Uh, we'd love to have you join with us at either 8.30 a.m. or at 10 o'clock a.m. on a Sunday morning. Uh, so with that, we hope that this Sunday sermon is a blessing and benefit to you and to whoever might be watching with you. God bless. Our gospel reading this morning comes to us from the gospel according to Mark chapter 10, reading verses 1 through 16. And Jesus left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. This is the word of the Lord. May be seated. Grace and peace to you this morning from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, So this fall on Wednesday nights, I've been teaching confirmation. uh, and In particular, our topic has been the Ten Commandments. Uh, So what we've been doing uh, is we've been looking at the commandments in conjunction with Jesus' own teachings on them. Uh, So we're kind of like bouncing from the Old Testament commandments into the New Testament explanations. And the thing is, as you do that, uh, one of the things you begin to see is Jesus is almost always battling uh, what I would call a bare minimum approach to the will of God. Uh, What I mean by that, uh, sometimes God's explicit commandment seems to set the bar kind of low. (laughs) Uh, But then when Jesus goes on to explain it, God's original intent is a really high calling. Uh, So just to give an example of this, I'll give one example so we can kind of put some flesh on it. Uh, But at confirmation last week, we were looking at the fifth commandment in particular, which is... And you guys need to come back to confirmation. All right. <laughs> Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. Um, so the fifth commandment is you shall not murder, right? You shall not murder. And so the, that is the explicit commandment. And you just kind of think about it, I'll step out. It's like, you shall not murder. Yeah? Like, all right, we didn't, no murders, right? No, right? That, that's not the intent, right? So you get to Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount in particular. He explains it. He says, don't even be angry with your brother. I don't even insult people. Don't even look at other people and wow, wow, that guy's an idiot. No, none of that. And so even though God's explicit commandment sets the bar kind of low, God's original intent is a really high calling. So here's why I mentioned that. Uh, if you go to today's reading that we just had, it is precisely that dynamic at play in regards to marriage, that is. See, kind of background to this, if we can fill it out. Uh, What had happened in the Old Testament is people were leaving their marriages in ways that were incredibly cruel. In particular, the husbands, they were the guilty ones in this for the most part, Uh, but the husbands would just kind of push their wives out. 
Uh, in other words, they could wake up on a whim and just get rid of them. It was sort of this like willy-nilly, I'm done with you sort of thing. And so what God did in response to that is through Moses, uh, he said to them, if you're going to get a divorce, you've got to give her a certificate of divorce. In other words, there's got to be a process. There's got to be paperwork. There's got to be a legal framework around this so that that person who is getting pushed out has at least a shrivel of a chance of landing on their feet. So that was the Old Testament rule. And what happens, fast forward to today's passage, and the Pharisees come up to Jesus and they ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And the thing is, it's not an honest question. They're just trying to put him in a pickle. Uh, or the way that our passage puts it, they're trying to, quote, test him. Meaning, they're trying to see whether he's going to contradict something God said in the Old Testament. Namely, you could get a divorce. And kind of their mindset behind that is that bare minimum approach to the will of God. Meaning, we know the rule of Jesus. We know it. If you're going to get a divorce, like, make it amicable. Really? You see, what Jesus tells them, he says, it was because of your hardness of heart that God said that. In other words, he set the bar kind of low because you guys were a disaster. And yet, here's the thing. Uh, What if God's original intent for your marriage is actually a really high calling? In other words, what if God actually wanted your marriage to be happy? What if he wanted to make it holy? Uh, What if God actually has great plans for your marriage? And so you see, that's what Christ launches into after he kind of rebukes them. Uh, In the passage, he goes all the way back to Genesis. This is our first reading today. And he looks at God's original intent for marriage. And so what we're going to do for the rest of this, we're going to look at just two things that come from that, okay? And they're they're almost like principles, you could say, for a good and godly marriage. Um, one thing I'll say is kind of a caveat before we jump into them. Uh, if we adopt these things, right, these two principles, we adopt them, it is not like the second that we do that, everything in your marriage is going to be fixed. It doesn't work that way. Bad habits are really hard to break. And broken people are super slow to be healed. And so this is not going to be instantaneous. And yet I will say over time, the things this passage talks about can be incredibly powerful in a marriage. Okay, so with that, let's go to these two things. We'll start with the first. Uh, The first church I was a pastor, it was this really big church over in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, I was one of five associate pastors on staff. So it's like a big staff, right? Uh, But in particular, I was called to be the pastor to young adults. Uh, We define that as anyone in their ages like 20 to 30. And the thing is, I was 29 at the time. So it seemed like a really good fit, right? Uh, So when I started out, we started meeting as a small group. And whenever we did that, we'd have a group of about 10 to 15 young adults, uh, the vast majority of whom were not married when I got started. And yet what happened over the course of the two years that I was there is a bunch of them started to get married, Uh, Not necessarily to each other, uh, but they were just meeting people, right? It's kind of that stage of life for a lot of people. Uh, So I remember this one guy in particular in our group. His name was Doug. The thing about Doug, he really wanted to be married. Uh, Everyone just kind of knew that about Doug. He was very open about it. Uh, He was almost always out on dates. He even had a profile on ChristianMingle.com that we laughed about quite a bit. (laughs) And so a lot of the times when our small group would meet, Doug would actually have one of his dates with him. Which, side note, Doug, come on, man. (laughs) First date, not a good idea, right? But you see, eventually what happened is Doug met a girl named Emily, and for whatever reason, this one stuck. She stuck. I see a lot of the other girls were sort of like a a one-and-done date sort of thing. Uh, And yet, not Emily. She just kept coming back. And in fact, to be totally honest, she and Doug seemed perfect for each other. Uh, He was a high school math teacher. She, too, was very nerdy. (laughs) It's like a match made in heaven, right? Uh, And so they dated for about eight months, at which point Doug decided 
to propose. And to literally no one's surprise, she said, she said yes, right? The thing is, we were incredibly happy for Doug. You could just feel it, right? Uh, So almost immediately, they started planning their wedding. Uh, They set a date. They got a venue for a reception. She went out and bought a dress. And so they're kind of starting to walk that road to their wedding day. Uh, But then this one day, it's a Saturday morning. I'm sitting in my apartment by myself. My phone rings. I look at it, and it is Doug. Pick it up, and I'm like, hey, Doug, how's it going? Like, really excited for him at this stage in his life, right? How's it going? And it's just silence. And I go, Doug? (laughs) Hello? And he goes, uh, hey. (laughs) You can just tell, right, by the way, he's, there is something off in this moment. I'm like, Doug, what is going on? And he goes, my mom and Emily have been fighting, is what he says. (laughs) And I'm like, really? About what? Consider that can of worms opened. (laughs) And he goes, it's about the ceremony. My mom wants it to be at our church. Emily wants it to be at her church. I'm just kind of caught in the middle. I can't see why they can't just get along. I don't know what to do. I'm so confused. I don't know what. Pastor Gary, what do I do? Right? That was his question. What do I do? And so I pause for a second. I'm like thinking like, oh man. And I just say to him, Doug, all I can tell you is I'm glad I'm not you, brother. <laughs> Click. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't do that, right? <laughs> Not at all. That's not what I did. Uh, you see, here's the thing about this. Uh, at the time, Christy and I were also engaged to be married. Uh, and we were reading this book by Tim Keller called The Meaning of Marriage. It's a great book. I totally commend it to you. Even if you're not married, The Meaning of Marriage by Tim Keller. Uh, but you see, in this, in this book, he spends a bunch of time on one verse in particular. And in fact, Jesus actually quotes it in our gospel reading. In verse 7, uh, but it's actually from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, from our Old Testament reading, right after the creation of Adam and Eve. And so this is going to be part of God's like, original intent for marriage, this high calling that we have in our married life. And what God says is, therefore, a man will, what will he do? Leave his father and mother, and he will hold fast to his wife. Another translation, I think it's actually better. I think it's the New King James. It says a, a man is going to have to leave his father and mother, and he's going to cleave to his wife. Leave and cleave, right? No matter which way you translate it, what that's saying is if you want the kind of marriage that God intends, you've got to put your spouse ahead of your parents. And so that's what I told him. I said, Doug, you just got to take Emily's side on this. So we hang up the phone, and what does Doug do? Not that. (laughs) No. No. Uh, Instead, he tries to mediate. He's a man of peace, right? He tries to make both of them happy. He refuses to take a side. And you see, after about a month of that little tug of war, what do you think happened? She called it off. Leave and cleave, Doug. You got to do it. But you see, he couldn't bring himself to do it. And whereas I thought her response was, a little harsh, I think she could see the writing on the wall. Namely, that as much as Doug wanted to marry her, he was not ready to leave and cleave. And what I mean by that is he was not ready to put her first. And the thing is, that's not going to work in any marriage. So here's the thing about this. One of the things studies show Uh, as difficulties with in-laws are one of the most common fights in a marriage. Uh, So if you fight over your in-laws, you're not abnormal, right? (laughs) Uh, In fact, what these studies typically say is there are four things that every married couple fights about at one time or another. You want to know what they are? (laughs) Those will be fun. You probably probably name them yourself. Uh, But it is, first of all, money. That's the first fight. Uh, These aren't necessarily in order of importance or prevalence or anything like that. Uh, Money, uh, primarily because you usually have a spender and a saver. The other one, sex, usually because one person wants it more than the other. The other one, chores, someone feels very overwhelmed, like they're doing everything, right? And then the fourth one, in-laws. Hence all the mother-in-law jokes. (laughs) And so I do think this is an issue that a lot of people struggle with 
And yet, the, at the same time that I say that, I want to emphasize something. That is not the only thing that leave and cleave is directed at. You see, in the biblical world, everyone just kind of assumed that your father and your mother were going to be your greatest allegiance. And so what that means is leave your father and mother is really just more generally saying, when you get married, you've got to leave everything that would compete for your heart's allegiance. Everything. Everything. And whereas maybe that sounds good in theory to us, I think in reality there are a ton of married people who feel like they are still constantly competing for their spouse's heart. There are all sorts of things you could be competing with. And I'll mention just three very typical ones, but these aren't the only, but I'll mention three. Uh, One is you're competing with their work. You might say that he loves you, but it definitely seems that that is where his heart really is. Another one, you're competing with the kids. Uh, Pre-kids, you were the world to her. Post-kids, more like in the background. (laughs) Or the last one I'll mention in a lot of marriages now, I think this is relatively recent, but I don't know for sure. But in a lot of marriages now, uh, people are competing now with all sorts of distractions. He's always on his computer. She's always on her phone. You go to bed at night, you've got screens killing every chance at a real conversation. And so you see what I'm saying is no matter which way you dice it, what a lot of us are failing in our marriages is giving our wife or giving your husband the ultimate attention and affection of your heart. And yet, according to our passage, that is precisely what it takes to have a happy and holy marriage. You gotta leave. You do that so that you can cleave. Meaning, for instance, if we just kind of go through those three again, I don't want to delay it too long, Uh, but at the end of the day, you leave work. Leave it. And not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, you leave it behind. You do that so that you can cleave to your wife. In other words, be present to her when you get home. Uh, at a particular point, leave the kids. And just to be clear, I'm not recommending abandoning them, right? Like, <laughs> Pastor Garrett said, just leave. no, right? That's not what I'm saying. Uh, but find a babysitter and go out. If you can't find a babysitter, put the kids to bed, spend time together, right? Uh, but at some point, you've got to leave and cleave, meaning get away from the kids Focus on each other. And then finally, all the distractions that vie for our hearts, uh, leave it. Close the computer. Shut off the phone. Leave the device. Cleave to your wife, guys. You see, because that is what a marriage is. It is not a contract between roommates to just do life together. No, that's not what it is. It is a covenant between lovers to put each other first. So that's the first principle of a better marriage. Leave and cleave. Uh, Let's go to the second thing. Uh, So one one of the things you'll see in a marriage, and I've mentioned this in a sermon before, but entirely different context, so maybe you won't remember. That'd be great. Um, But over the course of a marriage, sometimes what will happen is uh, what ha- will happen with a couple is they'll start to become essentially the same person. Uh, and what I mean by that is they begin to think the same. They begin to talk the same. They'll start finishing one another's sentences. And then for some, especially if they've been married a really long time, they even begin to look the same. It is weird. I look at some of you who have been married for a really long time, like, oh my goodness, did you marry your sister? But no, that, that's just the way that it works, right? And you see, the phrase the Bible uses to describe that phenomena, if you see it in today's passage, it's the two shall become one flesh. Meaning when you start a marriage, you begin with two separate people. But over time, God's goal is for those two people to become one. Meaning in particular, you and your spouse develop a certain oneness of heart. Or another way to put that, you and your spouse develop intimacy of spirit. And so the thing is, 
I know culturally we talk about, quote unquote, finding your soulmate. But the biblical view is you never just find your soulmate. It is rather that you become soulmates. In other words, it's a process. And you see, that process is part of the mystery that God built into marriage. And so what that means is if you want the kind of marriage that God intends for you, and what our passage is saying is not only do you need to leave and cleave, you also need to become one flesh. Which, I don't know, sounds great, right? It's like, wow, that'd be amazing, right? But the question that it begs is how? How does it happen? It's because one thing I'll say about it, it is not automatic. It's not like spending your life together automatically makes you intimate with one another. In fact, a lot of people over the course of their marriage, they just get further and further apart. And so the question is, how do you actually get closer and become truly one in your marriage? Oh, this is going to seem kind of random. Just hang with me. Uh, so when I was growing up, typically at, my, at Christmas, my parents would just tell me what to get my sisters for Christmas, right? You have kids, sometimes you just had to tell them. Uh, I have two older sisters, and so whenever it got close to Christmas, it was my mom in particular who would usually take me out shopping. Uh, and yet this one year in particular, I think I was around 11 years old, it was my dad who took me out. And for whatever reason, he decided that that year I was going to choose what I got my sisters for Christmas. Maybe he didn't know any better than I did. That's possible. <laughs> or maybe he figured I was mature enough to figure it out. I don't know. Either way, uh, we go to the mall together. I use my own allowance and I get each of my sisters a gift. We get home. I do everything I can to wrap it up pretty nicely. I put them under the tree. And so a couple weeks later, it's Christmas morning. Kind of waddle out of bed. We start opening all the gifts that we got for each other. My sister, Brooke, in particular, she's four years older than I, so I'm 11, she's 15 at this point. She gets to the gift that's for me. She takes it out of that beautiful wrapping. She holds it up and she goes, oh my goodness, what is this? And I go, it's a tape. Some of you guys who are young, right? You don't know what a tape is. We used to put music on a thing called tapes. It was great, right? It's a tape, I say. And she goes, yeah, I know that, Garrett, but I have a CD player. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, but I have a tape player. And duh. And then she looks at the tape and she goes, really? See, because on top of the fact that I bought her a tape, it was the tape of this one particular band. Uh, their name, you may remember them, or more likely not, uh, their name was Corn. It's Corn with a K, if you remember that. Uh, they were kind of like a heavy metal sort of thing. You bang your head to the music, and the thing is, I thought Corn was awesome. You're great. Uh, now, did my sister love Corn? Oh, heck no. Oh, she's more like a Brian Adams type of girl. Everything I do, I do it for you, right? Which, that's fine, I don't know. Uh, but I figured everyone's got to love Freak on a Leash. It's just, it's a good song. And so you see, almost 30 years later, this still lives on in our family lore, uh, that the very first gift I got for someone in my family was a corn tape which really just means what? It means the very first gift I got for someone was for myself. That's the thing about it. I wanted that gift. And yet, when it comes to gifts, who should you really be thinking about when you give a gift? The other person, right? And so here's the thing about that. How do you become one in your marriage? Remember, that's our question. Like, how do you become one? And you see, the biblical answer to that is you've got to give each other a very particular gift. And before I mention what it is, where I'm getting this, I'm not just kind of making it up out of thin air. Uh, it's from a passage in Ephesians 5. Uh, in that passage, it is all about a husband and a wife becoming one flesh. That's what it's about. And what it says at the very end, it's very brief, it says, husbands, love your wives, is what it says. And then it says, wives, Respect your husbands. Love and respect. And what's fascinating about this, so those are the gifts, right? But what's fascinating about this, studies show two things. First of all, that's what we actually want. Meaning wives really do want their husbands to love them. Go figure, right? 
On the flip side, husbands really do want their wives to respect them. And so what Ephesians 5 is calling for is spot on. And yet the other thing studies show is that is not the gift we typically give. See, instead, we tend to give each other the gift that we would want. In other words, husbands tend to be pretty good at respecting their wives. Wives tend to be pretty good at loving their husbands, which really just means we all tend to be pretty good at giving each other a very nicely wrapped corn tape. And maybe we're thinking to ourselves as we do that, why is this not making you happy? Right? This would make me happy. And yet when it comes to giving a gift, who should you be thinking about? Not yourself, but the other person. And so again, husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Studies show that's what we want. And so just real quick, I want to kind of sketch what each of those things looks like. Try to put a little bit of flesh on them. Uh, so just to start with the guys, what does it mean to love your wife? Uh, one way to think about it, if you think about the way that you relate to your friends, you have some friends, think about the way that you relate to them. Uh, when it comes to friends, you kind of enjoy their company, I would think. Uh, you laugh together. You joke about things. Uh, you would never talk about your friends behind their back. Uh, you would never do anything wrong to them. You would literally give the shirt off your own back for one of your friends, right? And the thing is, for a lot of a husband, it's like, yeah, that's because I love my friends. And yet, no, that's not it. It's because you respect your friends. Everything I just described, it's not love, it's respect. The thing is, that's not what your wife wants. And I'm not saying, like, just disrespect your wife. Not saying, like, I'm just saying respect on its own is not enough for her. It's not. As much as people talk about how great it is to marry your best friend, uh, if you're a guy, when your wife married her, I guarantee you she was not thinking, I hope he treats me just like one of the dudes. Like, no, right? You see, to love your wife is different. In particular, it means that you actually cherish her which you made a vow to do on your wedding day. Love and cherish. You cherish her. Meaning you go out of your way to make her feel special. Somebody tells me you're not doing that with the guys, right? <laughs> you go out of your way to make her feel special. You actually listen to the little things she says. <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, you try to be in the know in terms of what she likes, what she needs, how she's feeling lately. Maybe the most practical piece of, of advice I've got for you this morning. So guys, make it a point to take your wife on dates. And not with a bunch of other people. It's just like, let's go out with the guy. No, stop. Just you and her. And that's it. And the thing is, just to be clear as I'm talking about this, I have no idea what I'm talking about right now. Um, I'm not your wife. <laughs> Uh, but where I'm getting all of this is in conversations with my wife. And really, the best thing is, talk to your wife. What would actually make her feel loved in your marriage? Just ask. Okay, so that's husbands. Love your wives. Uh, flip side, wives, respect your husbands. This is going to be a fun one to do. Uh, so maybe the best way to think about this one, if you think about your kids, right? Uh, one thing about your kids, you love your kids, right? It's kind of a given. Uh, but you see, for the most part, they don't know what they're doing. Your kids, they don't know what they're doing. Uh, so what that means is you've got to reserve the right to step in and take control. Uh, especially if it seems like they can't handle something. You've got to take charge of that situation. Uh, you've got to keep an eye on them. You've got to look over their shoulder. You definitely just can't trust that they're going to do something they said they're going to do. You better follow up on that, right? And you see, what that means is while you love your kids, you don't respect them. You respect them as a human being, I get it. But no, you don't respect them. Which is fine. They're kids. They don't know what they're doing. And yet, what about your husband? 
And you might be sitting there thinking to yourself, yeah, he doesn't know what he's doing either. <laughs> Stop, right? <laughs> Stop. Uh, you might think that, whatever, but do you respect your husband? Not do you love him. It's not the gift that he wants. Do you respect him? Meaning, do you make it a point to build him up? Would be one thing. Uh, do you believe in your heart of hearts that you married a good man? And do you tell him that? Do you let him just handle things in the way that he handles them? <laughs> Not in the way you would. You see, no guy, when he gets married, is thinking, man, what I really need is another mom. No. We're not thinking that. But what we are thinking is I need a wife. And I need a wife who respects me. And the thing is, I'm just going to bet at one point you probably did. Uh, the truth is, and this is for both husbands and wives now, you kind of loop them together. A part of before you got married, part of the reason you fell in love, husbands, at a particular point, you really did make your wife feel special. In other words, you cherished her. And wives, you really did make your husband feel like he was a good man. In other words, you admired him. You see, part of God's high calling for our marriages is that long after those feelings have kind of died down, the heartfelt actions of love and respect carry on in ways that are even deeper and more meaningful than before. The goal of which is, over time, you develop a deep intimacy of spirit. Meaning the two of you really do become one flesh. But again, it's not automatic. It won't just happen for you. It's a matter of husbands, love your wives, wives, respect your husbands. And the mystery of marriage is that when that happens, two people who are incredibly different become one flesh in a very real and beautiful way. So those are the two principles. Leave and cleave, become one flesh. Uh, that's the two principles of a happy and holy marriage. And just to kind of wrap this up, I remember the first time I heard a sermon on marriage. I remember it distinctly. I was 17 years old. I was going to Grace Baptist at the time. Uh, and I'll be honest, I heard this sermon on marriage. I felt like I got gypped. <laughs> and what I mean by that is I came to that service hungering for Jesus, and I, all I left with was a mouthful of marriage. And what I was thinking is, I'm not even married. None of this applies to me. And yet what I would say to 17-year-old me, and also to anyone here who's not married, is that's actually not true. You see, because you are married. You are the bride of Christ, is what God himself calls you. So you're married. And what that means is everything we just looked at, in terms of God's high calling for marriage, is directly applicable to God's even higher calling on your life. And so if you remember, I'll just go through, leave and cleave. Leave and cleave, meaning whatever's competing with Christ for your heart's allegiance. Come on, there's stuff competing for it, right? Whatever's competing for your heart, leave it. Cleave to Christ. He left his father to cleave to you. Secondly, become one flesh, meaning God's goal in this thing we call faith is that you and I start to develop the heart and mind of Christ. How? How? By love and respect. Meaning embrace the love that he gives to you. He's pouring it out. 
and then respect the will that he has for you. He knows what he's doing. It's a great mystery, is what Ephesians 5 calls it. That not only does God have this high calling and beautiful design for your marriage, but that he has an even higher calling and more beautiful plan for your life. Namely, that you become one with Jesus Christ. If only we would embrace and learn from the love that he has for us, then perhaps our marriages would begin to be as happy and holy as God has always intended them to be. So with that, let's pray. God in heaven, for every husband and wife in this place right now, grant a renewal of their marriage. Especially for those whose marriages have been hard, God, give all the more grace. And by the prayers and the patience of your people, bring healing into our homes. And also healing into our hearts as well. Father, for all of us, married or not, that our union with Christ would be ever more real, we pray. That you would instill in us the principles of this passage that we might become one flesh with the one who is giving himself to us. We pray all of this in his name and all God's people said, Amen.